Welcome back to Kettlebells and Cocktails. I am Nikki Brazier, and I am joined by Joe Jenatin Palawa from the Morning Chalk Up for this week's edition of the Weekly Buzz. How's it going, Joe? All right, Nikki. How are you? I'm good. I'm tired, but I'm probably not as tired as you, who is mm, what up a weekend. all weekend. <laughs> yeah, paying attention to all things Rogue Invitational. And I think it only makes sense that we start there because that is certainly the top headline I think anyone and everyone in the CrossFit world is talking about right now. So how did it go from your perspective, watching yeah. all the action, writing about all the action? Oh, man. All right. Let's get into it. What a weekend. Lots of changes on the fly with the programming and uh, just dealing with the weather, um, moving inside, moving outside, um, changing implements a little bit here and there. Um, but incredible performances across the board. The athletes really stepped up in both divisions, adjusting on the fly. Great competition. Really similar results to the games. If we look at the leaderboard, so I think we'll talk about both sides, but overall really similar results among the, 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 the cream of the crop, the tip of the spear. The levels of fitness seem to be fairly similar as they were a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, I guess, at this point. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I do think that the tiny changes are where the biggest stories are, oh, at sure. least in my opinion. Sure, so sure. do we start with the men or the women? What do you think? Hmm, let's start with the men. Okay, let's start on the men's side. All right. So on the men's side, Patrick Vellner wins for the second time in his career. He won the first time in 2020 when the Rogue Invitational was held online mm -hmm. due to the pandemic changes. And he's taken second place two other times. This is his first win in person at the Rogue Invitational. And it was a it was a pretty, pretty solid performance after the first event. He typically the typical Vellner start with a 13th place after the first event. But yeah. then from from there until the end of the last day he averaged about a third place finish the last day didn't go as well he had a ninth and two tenth places but by the last event he more or less had it in the bag another canadian on the podium jeff adler current fittest man on earth looked great won the first event the running event texas heavy and won the last event with the moderately heavy cleans and double unders the cleans were at 225 for men he won Heavy Grace last year in the final event at Rogue also. So the, the moderate heavy clean is, is really wheelhouse for Jeff Adler. Mm -hmm. Third place, Roman Krennikov looked really good coming back from his foot injury and looked solid across the weekend. He won event three, which was the circus event with the big dumbbell. So that was a fun one. Brent Fakowski, fourth place again. He posted about it earlier today or yesterday, and he referred to it as another invisible medal for his trophy case. So two tough finishes in fourth place for Brent Fakowski, but three out of the top four, Team PB&J from Wadapalooza a couple of years ago, three Canadians in the top four. So I think it's really interesting. I think it's, it's a little bit how most of us thought it was going to go, right? Like those are names... You were like, the podium is going to be these three guys. Even if you were like, the top four is going to be these three guys. Let's include Brent because that is a really sad post. I think a lot of people, a lot of fans of the sport would be like, yeah, that makes total sense. I fully understand. I fully understand why you would pick those names for the top of the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. But to me, it is a very big deal that Pat Valner finished first. Mm. Why do you say that? I, well, because I feel like. There's been a lot of discussion in the community around Jeff Adler and his win at the CrossFit Games because I think he maybe is a name that people underestimate or have mm -hmm. historically underestimated in the past. And for him to come out and win the games amongst all of these people or, or amongst all the chatter being like, who is this guy? When did he get so good? How did that happen? Is he really that good? Do we need to ask about would Roman have finished on top if he didn't have that foot injury? These mm -hmm. are all just discussions that people have had. And by the way, I don't really like any of the chatter that discredits the winner. So that didn't mm, really come sure. out right. 
my comment about Roman. But I do think it's a question that people are asking in terms of who is the fittest and what does that mean? My personal opinion is anyone who wins in the moment is in fact the fittest in that moment. So you can ask the question about Roman's foot injury and what would have happened, but this is what did happen. So even if it was due to the injury in that Mm -hmm. moment, Jeff Adler was the fittest man on earth. But I feel like he had a lot to prove coming out Mm -hmm. to a competition so quickly timed after games, Mm -hmm. right? Like he's just Mm -hmm. coming off that, that podium win. And I think a lot of people are like, if he's the fittest man on earth, truly, he can do it again, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I think Pat Valner stepping up and winning just says a lot. You could chalk it up to a lot of things if you want. You could chalk it up to maybe Pat's fitter. You could chalk it up to the programming here. It's better for Pat than it is for Jeff. You could do whatever. There's a million ways sure. to skin this mm-hmm. cat. I just, I love all of the questions and the discussion and the things that can come from this and have it having Jeff not be like a repeat top of the podium back to back in these two competitions, I think yeah. just gives us a lot of water cooler chat. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think, I think for sure. Pat ended, ended the competition and uh, his post uh, competition interview saying that he feels like he has to continue to, to go out and remind people that he's still there, even though he's, yeah. he's always somewhere in the top five, but he has to remind people that he's still in contention every time he steps on the competition floor for a podium spot for a win and uh, so clearly he he thinks about those things uh, that factors in adler looking at the events he won the first event and won the last event but in between there he was middle of the packs basically mm-hmm. averaged between an eighth and a tenth place finish in in the seven events in the middle there i mean consistent but just consistently even keel right in the middle but so on the one hand, great consistency. On the other hand, not really the same if we look at Pat, second place, third place, fourth place, third place, yeah, third yeah, place. Yeah. But Adler didn't have the 13th place, the that kind of thing. But yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I should have mentioned when we were talking at, at the top here that Fukowski and Krenikov actually tied on points. Krenikov That's had right. the tiebreaker this time around. So at the games, it was... It was a tough finish for Brent in the last event here. He took fourth overall in the last event and then fourth because of the tie break. Ricky Gerard, Ricky Gerard took fifth, looked good coming back from the shoulder injury. Travis Mayer looked good coming back after last season's thumb injury, the ligament injury yep. that he had. So a couple of really good performances in fifth and sixth place for those guys. Great to see that as well. Were there any sort of shocks down the leaderboard or, or places where you were like, mm. oh man, I didn't expect this person to end up here? Well, uh, you know, nobody wants to see anybody get injured. Yonikowski had a, a a, an ankle injury on the first day. And so wouldn't have expected to see Koski at the very bottom of the leaderboard. Otherwise, I think it looked fairly, fairly like what we might imagine. It, maybe Chandler Smith. I know he had a great time clearly sliding down the hill and and hitting that 610 pound deadlift but 13th place i think that that's probably a little little bit of underperforming for for chandler for a, an event like rogue right yeah that was sort of the one thing i had on my list too is i was expecting to see him certainly top 10 and i really would have liked to see him top 5 mm-hmm. he had a great season this past season finished finished pretty well at games i think he came in second in rogue last year mm-hmm. or yep so my, I don't have my wires crossed on years. So I was sort of expecting a, a little bit of a better performance from him, but I think he was too. He said it in one of his post-event interviews. I can't remember which one. He was like, it's been an up and down weekend for me. <laughs> but I do love that he doesn't ever take himself too seriously and that he was able to yeah. have a good time with it regardless. And he's certainly yeah. a crowd favorite. So the the more we... The more we know and love and watch the sport, the more you and I get to know the athletes. Yeah, it's for sure. really hard to see them go through uh, yeah. a tough time. The tough part about Rogue, I think, is that because there are only 20 athletes and because they're all the friggin' best of the best, someone's going to come in last. And it's sure. inevitably going to be someone we all love. So yeah. it does make it hard. But it made it fun to watch. There was never a dull moment. because Yeah, it was, it, was, it was really fun. One last thing on the men's side. Great to see Noah Olson top mm-hmm. 10 finish, possibly likely the last time we see him compete as an individual. So good to see him out there. 
but lots of fun stuff ahead for Noah. I think he's going to be a great addition to the team side of things. And I think yeah. he's going to bring some fun to, to that side. Let's talk about the women's division. Yes. Okay. All right. Everybody, everybody was following along, right? Everybody, all eyes on Tia and Laura. And it was a back and forth battle the entire weekend. I think everybody expected to see Tia come out and do well. I think most people believed that she wouldn't be there if she didn't think she could do well. I think that she probably surprised quite a few people on how how well her well was, mm-hmm. how well she did. A couple of first place finishes, a couple of second place, third place, and was in the lead heading into the final day. Really back and forth battle with Laura. Laura looked poised. I, I was not, not that I was surprised in any way by seeing this, but she she's you talk about an athlete kind of performing within themselves like she didn't she didn't get caught up in the moment. She wasn't caught yeah. up in the race. She was very much playing her game, running her race. That's what I saw when I when I looked at the at, at the two of them. What did you what did you think? I just thought it was truly two of the greats going mm-hmm. head to head and it was awe inspiring on every level, I think. I have a personal (laughs) love for what Tia is doing now Mm -hmm. and how she's stepping out postpartum and how she's finding her career path and journey as it aligns with her motherhood journey. I think it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I love watching Laura, who has a lot of adversity, which is unfortunate given Mm -hmm. her status and title of fittest woman on earth, who I think is been facing a ton of, I personally believe, really unfair (laughs) asterisks on her performance. Yeah, for sure. And I love watching her come out, like you said, really poised and really confident Mm -hmm. and not Mm -hmm. like she had a chip on her shoulder, not like she had anything to prove, but really there to make a statement of, I am this athlete with this title and yeah, yeah, for sure. And let me show you. And, And here it is. So I just, it just felt really like a battle of these giants, you know what I mean? And it was good to watch. Yeah, it was, it was great. And I think this sets up a a great 2024 season. I'm, Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about this for months to come here about Mm -hmm. these two athletes. And clearly at, at this event, they were, it was their race, Tia and Laura, and then everybody else to a certain extent. A little Um, bit. But within that, everybody else category there's a lot of parody there and those though the 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 race for the last podium spot was really fun to watch emma lawson took third this is her third podium in a row i believe between rogue and the games and uh, looked really solid gabby magawa similar to brent fakowski in the sense that she placed fourth at the game she placed fourth at rogue relatively quiet-ish kind of performance for her second place on the first day second place in event seven on the on sunday otherwise quiet middle of the pack but really consistent and i like this i don't want to necessarily call it a a rivalry but this back and forth between her and emma lawson Mm -hmm. was really fun to watch for the for the podium going down a little bit more alex gazan fifth place at the games fifth place at rogue Crushed. Massive, she massive great. dead, 125 <laughs> pounds. Super fun to watch. And it looked like she could have pulled, I don't know, 450, mm-hmm. maybe more. It looked like a pretty smooth deadlift at 425. Uh, yeah, so I think all all of those athletes, the men included, probably could have lifted even bigger numbers had they not had to at that point have done like 500 deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was a yeah, long that's, event. That's <laughs> That that's a, that's a topic of conversation. Maybe not for here, but eighteen barbells to get to your to get to your one rep max. Yeah. yeah so going down further, Emma Carey, great, great, yep. great competition for her sixth place. Danielle Brandon seventh place. Ariel Lowen eighth. Danny Spiegel ninth, and all of them looked great. Similar similar placing for for Danielle. Ariel dropped a little bit between the games and and Rogue, but you know there could be any number of reasons for that. Some programming things, other things, but clearly she was having a lot of fun. Crowd was singing happy birthday to her, and it was great to see her out there too. Danny with that great performance on the dual three, that was super oh fun God. to watch. 
I think that was my favorite event to watch over the entire weekend. I love a knockout event. It's so much fun. And I thought it was really clever the way the top athletes got a buy and the bottom athletes had to sort of like work their way in to, to yeah. meet them in round two or three or whatever it was, because I don't know if it gave them an advantage or a disadvantage. Mm. And I just thought that was really interesting. Like on the yeah. one hand, they had already done a couple heats of it. So they were probably a little bit more fatigued, but at the other hand, it was like a 24 second event. So I don't know how yeah. much more fatigued they really were. And they already had a sense of what they needed to do mm -hmm. by the time they went out there. So I just thought the whole thing was really clever. And I, I loved watching her claw her way from the first heat into that final two. It was yeah. like, my heart was racing. <laughs> I can't relax. <laughs> and it was great, great sportsmanship on both sides seeing, cause it could get, you could imagine where it gets a little heated as, as it gets down to the top five and the top two, but just seeing the athletes hugs and high fives and fist bumps and all of it with the close finishes and everything. It was really great, really great to watch. I think we always end up talking at least a little bit about does the buy help in round one for the top athletes or does it hurt them? Yeah. And I mean, I think in the moment it could do one or the other. And so it is, it is mm -hmm. always fun to see. That's all I have on, on rogue for now. Any, do you have any uh, concluding thoughts? I think it is just really telling just if we mentioned, isn't it only like a 10 point difference between Tia and Laura at the very end of the day? Oh my gosh. 10 points. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I think it's just really telling as to what the next few competitions are going to be like that both of those women end up at. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us as a community to frame this competition for what it is and mm -hmm. not say anything along the lines of, well, if Tia had just one more month postpartum, she totally would have <laughs> won. Or, oh, well, sure. if Laura hadn't done this and she would have been further ahead in the points. Mm -hmm. Like when we get the end results in that moment, this is the winner. She mm -hmm. is the fittest or the fastest or whatever, depending on the competition. This is the second place. She is the second <laughs> fittest or whatever, whatever. Sure. And I just, I just think that that is, that's important for them. We can look at it in the context of the greater event and the context of what we're doing as a community. But I think, so I think it's fair to say, obviously going to be a tight race from here on out or maybe it wouldn't take much for tia to pull ahead depending on x y or z those discussions are all yeah, valid but yeah. i just i loved the way it shook out it was not how i thought it would go mm. i'm eating some of my own words here <laughs> but i i just thought it was rad and i'm excited to see what comes down the pipeline because that is going to be a tough battle and i think tia is going to want to prove something when she gets back to games next year I oh think. yeah oh yeah i agree i agree across the board all right. Well, one other really big piece of news last week. This is on the on the CrossFit HQ side of things. Big announcement right before Rogue that CrossFit hired a new vice president for affiliates and operations, a guy named Jay DeCoons. He has previously worked for a couple of other boutique fitness companies at the top level, at the top executive level, including the Bar Method most recently and brought in to help the affiliates to work with the affiliates and almost immediately stepped right into the the uh, the heat of of being a public figure within the crossfit space and by that i mean some video surfaced of a panel that he was on in 2018 at south by southwest talking about boutique fitness and in that on that panel he said some things that rubbed people the wrong way, including that he thought that CrossFit could be unsafe, performed at home alone, potentially unsafe, even in a gym setting. And so the Morning Chalk Up reached out to De Kunst and CrossFit and asked for a response. We got that response. He said, I'll read you a couple of his quotes here, and then we can talk about it. I don't think CrossFit is dangerous. Several years ago, I didn't have a lot of exposure to what goes on inside an affiliate. Over the last five years of doing CrossFit, the level of fitness I've achieved has exceeded anything I've seen with other programs. This firsthand experience changed my understanding of CrossFit and is why I'm so excited to work here. We also asked a little bit more about his experience with CrossFit in an affiliate setting. He said that he started his CrossFit journey at CrossFit Burlingame in the Bay Area and then is now at Invictus Seattle, and that he plans to do the Open this spring. Okay. 
So that's what we heard. There's a lot there. <laughs> I will say that I I know I know a lot of people have really big feelings about Jay. I don't know if we're on a first name basis or not. I'll call him mm-hmm. Jay for sure. now. My buddy Jay. And where he comes from and is he the best suited for this role? A lot of those feelings are sort of wrapped up in the context of the decisions that CrossFit has made recently with its overall staffing and the people that they've let go specifically on the affiliate and operations side of things. There's a greater question about where the entire brand is heading. Mm -hmm. Some people think it's going to be sold. There's a lot of uh, private equity comments floating around. And I think it's all valid. Personally, I just need to see a few action items before I can truly form an opinion. I need to see what happens. I need to see what kind of promises he makes or what kind of things that he does, what kind of actions he takes Mm -hmm. before I can say one way or another, if this is the right guy or the wrong guy, or he's, he's amazing or he's a piece of shit, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know anything yet. And I, to me, just if you're just looking at this, hey, here's a dude who said CrossFit was dangerous, and then you asked him about it, and he was like, hey, that was the wrong thing to say. I've learned better, and I've grown. My opinion has changed. Mm-hmm. That does not particularly bother me or rub me the wrong way because I think that we all sure. deserve an opportunity to learn and grow and change our minds. Yeah. But I do know that some people feel quite strongly that if he thought that and he said that publicly a few years ago, he's not the right person for this role. And I understand where those folks are yeah. coming from. I'm not one of them, I'm kind of like, okay, he admitted that he was wrong and now he's in this role and let's see what he can do. But yeah, there's certainly a lot that remains to be seen to figure out whether or not this is the right decision and a step in the right direction for the brand. Yeah. I mean, I I look at it from a a couple of different uh, perspectives here. One on, on, as a, as a, as a media person, the fact that he was willing to respond very quickly to comments and, and questions to me, that's a good sign. I was I was really appreciative that he and CrossFit w- responded quickly. I'm not an affiliate owner, but I have been coaching at my affiliate since 2017, and I, I certainly understand any apprehension that if that an affiliate owner would have with yeah. a new VP in this role that that seemingly has far less affiliate beer well affiliate owner experience. He admitted that he doesn't, he has never owned an affiliate. So I can understand that. But uh, along the same lines as as you're thinking, until he starts to show what he wants to do in this role, I want to reserve some, some judgment here. Is there probably, are there other folks in the fitness space that could fulfill this role that maybe also have affiliate experience? Sure. I mean, I'm sure there are, but you know, until in, until I'm in charge of the hiring, there's not much <laughs> I could do about that, right? I'm waiting for that day, Joe. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got a lot of ideas. We all do. This entire community does. That that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that we're of a similar mind here, though. So maybe maybe we'll just wrap it up there with a big news week. I personally know I'm looking forward to a calm afternoon. I hope. Um, you deserve a break, <laughs> sir. Thank you for um, keeping us all yeah. very updated on all things, uh, both sort of like CrossFit brand heavy and also competition wise over the course of the weekend. If you guys missed any of the coverage of Rogue, the stream is up on YouTube and the Morning Chalk Up has lots and lots of recaps for you guys, articles on their site and posts on their Instagram page from the entire weekend and more mm-hmm. to come, right, Joe? Yep. More evaluation yep. on everything 100%. that we saw over the course of the weekend on the competition floor. And so that kind of wraps it up for us here on the Weekly Buzz. Lots of fun stuff in the Mm -hmm. works. We will be back next week with the top headlines from the Morning Chalk Club. And until then, we will catch you guys soon.